I suppose that I suppose most of us dream of the perfect put-down, the verbal squelch which flattened the bore, the rude or the aggressive drunk. For instance, Bernard Shaw was once dining in a restaurant and being serenaded by an appallingly bad orchestra. During the meal, the leader of the band noticed Shaw and he sent him a note asking him if there was anything he'd like them to play next. Uh, Shaw replied in one word, dominoes. Well, my first guest tonight has compiled a catalogue of put-downs in an entertaining book called Acid Drops. He's well fitted for the task, being himself a man renowned for his own wit and style, which he's displayed on stage, television, radio and movies. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Williams. Let's talk a little bit about this book of yours. How do you come to compile it? Well, it all really rose out of the fact that I was doing for... Um, for it's not that funny, hang on. <laughs> I, was doing, I was doing a series for the BBC called Quote Unquote. And on it, I used quotes of my own. They always said to you, the producer, before you come, bring several, because some of the things you find funny may not be palatable to <laughs> the broadcasting audience, you see. So one had, over the years, about seven years I was doing it, one had, over the years, com co quite a compendium of the material. And then this man said, why don't we publish a book, you see, with the, the funny things that you enjoy, especially the put-down things. Now, really malignant wit, aren't they? He said, you do enjoy it, don't you? And I said, yes, I do, actually. <laughs> I do like those sort of nasty cracks that people make. I mean, that one about Claire Booth Lewis opening the door for Dorothy Parker and saying, um, age before beauty, and Dorothy saying, yeah, and pearls before swine. <laughs> I thought that was very funny indeed. And I, like, I always liked the idea of having made a sort of crack like that oneself. And on one or two occasions, I have. Have you? Can you uh, remember? About, what? Can you remember? Well, yes, I mean, you know, just a minute. Yes. Just a minute is chaired by Nicholas Parsons, and I'm always saying it's incredible that he ever got the job, you know, I mean, he's a complete idiot. And <laughs> on one occasion I said to him, you are an ignorant nit, you see, and he turned to the audience and said, really, and said, I couldn't talk to people like that. And I said, of course you couldn't, you haven't got my vocabulary. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's quite a nice one, you see. What quite about the, in, in the book, though? Have there been any that you've collected since you wrote the book that are not in the book? Ah, oh, yes, because after you've done it, you see, people come up to you and say, you didn't put in the bit about, you see, and that's always annoying, because a marvellous one was told me by a musician who said, you've got quite a few about Beecham, and he's famous for the cracks, you know, he made some marvellous crack. And he said, you haven't got the one about, because uh, you know, he hated uh, Malcolm Sargent and called the BBC Symphony Orchestra when Sargent was conducting Sargent's Mess. And, um, <laughs> and then when they said to him uh, that Beecham was knighted, he said, well, it was only yesterday he was doctored. <laughs> <laughs> and then this musician said to me, you didn't put in the marvellous thing about his return from the Far East. And they, they said to Beecham, Sargent's return from the Far East. Fabulous tour of the Far East. And he said, oh, it's just another flesh in Japan. Which I thought was in charge. Flash in Japan. It's yeah, lovely, they... yes. <laughs> and here's a good one. It is yeah. a nice one, yes. They didn't like it, no, did they? they? <laughs> <laughs> what about the... I mean, is, is, the, is it this kind of wit? Is it the, the exclusive domain of, of theatricals? Oh, no, no. I think... Uh, I think... I think it, it, I mean, it's been... Um, it's been associated with statesmen, politicians. There's a marvellous one about uh, Bessie Braddock and Churchill when she said... Winston, you're drunk, and he said, Bessie, you're ugly, but tomorrow I'll be sober. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not only in the realm of theatre. I mean, it's in the what realm... about the academic world? Yes, the academics, some... too. There's mm. a wonderful one about Morris Byron, who's Vice-Chancellor of Oxford. He used to bathe in Parsons' Pleasure, which was a special preserve for all male bathing in the nude. And these, these men were all lying there, him and several other dons lying there with nothing on, and a punt came by with a lady and they all rushed their towels and shoved the towels round, you see, and Bowra put his towel over his head. And they said afterwards, why did you put your towel over your head? And he said, I don't know about the rest of you gentlemen, but in Oxford I'm known by my face. <laughs> Uh, 
What about, what about, so let's talk about the, the wit of some of the people that you've worked with. Of course, you worked with some of the great wits in the theatre. Uh, particularly one thinks of Coward. You didn't work with him, but you knew him, didn't I you? I knew him, mm. yes, and he always came to the dressing room and, and was always encouraging. Whatever mm. you were doing, he would turn up. Even when a thing wasn't that successful, he would always turn up. And I was working with Peter Schaffer, you recall the d double bill of Private and Public Eye, which I'd started with Maggie Smith. And Peter Schaffer brought him backstage, Noel Coward, and he was absolutely charming to both of us. And he said to me, you are thoroughly authentic. Whatever you do, my dear boy, you do in a thoroughly authentic fashion. That is the secret of all success. Be yourself, be authentic. And I thought, how oh, lovely, yes. I thought, oh, I loved it. I was preening and enjoying it. And Peter Schaffer went to Montego Bay. You know, he had that house there, yes. uh, Noel Coward. And he said uh, to me afterwards, he said, it wasn't a comfortable visit, you know. It wasn't a comfortable visit at all because he directed on the roof a glass sort of solarium where you could see the whole of the bay but unfortunately it wasn't the right glass apparently when you build a glass um, what do you call it solarium you're supposed to have two layers or something to keep out the heat and this only had one layer and it was like an oven it was an absolute furnace when the sun came up and he said we had this dinner there and he'd invited the governor Sir Hugh Foote and Lady Foote and they were all sweating, <laughs> terribly. I mean, Lady Foot was saying, oh, dear. It's <laughs> an oven in here, isn't it? And, and Coward... Lady Foot Co doesn't talk about and that. No, no, quite. <laughs> and uh, Coward was immaculate throughout in a white dinner jacket and said to them all, I don't believe in all this rubbish about in the tropics eat cool food. We're having an English meal and for the sweet ginger pudding flambe. <laughs> and I shall flambe it myself. And he went out to do this flambeing, and the Foots got up, and Lady Foots said, I can't, I'm sorry, please give my apologies, but I mean, it, it's pouring off me, you know, I really, I really can't stand any more of it. And, and she left. And they both left, you see, and Peter said, we were sat there alone, and back came Coward with this thing ablaze. Ginger pudding flambe. Where are the feet? <laughs> And he said, they've gone, they've gone, look at us, look at us all. We're all absolutely pouring sweat, it's like an oven in here. They've gone. And he said, well, you can go too. He said, no feet, no flambe. <laughs> <laughs> and he went out of the room again. What about, let's talk about an Australian you've worked with as well, uh, Sir Robert Helpman, because he's got a oh, reputation too. Oh, marvellous, yes. I was with Robert Helpman in a piece called Catch as Catch Can. It was an Anoui play about the Hundred Days of Napoleon. And they cast me for Napoleon. I know that sounds odd. I know that does sound odd. <laughs> But it's Napoleon, don't forget, in the Hundred Days. It's not the Napoleon of the, um, the triumphant period at all. It's that before the exile to St. Heli Hel Helena, what do you say, St. Hel St. Helena. That's right. Mm. And he come he's come back, and so they said to me, don't forget, it's got a cancerous um, stomach, so we'll give you a great padding there for this swelling here for his cancerous stomach. So I had this great swelling for the play, and Robert Helpman was playing Fouché, and we had a long scene, the secret police, he's the secret police chief for, for Louis XVIII and for Napoleon, and we had this long scene together. And uh, during the scene, this great padded stomach gradually moved round and round until having begun with this thing out here, I ended with an enormous bum, you see. <laughs> and it really was quite outrageous. And I said to him afterwards, I feel dreadful. It moved right round, you know. I had an enormous rear at the end of it all. And he said, no, don't worry, don't worry. They were cutting about there. You didn't notice at all. It looked lovely. And the stage manager on that stage manager told me that he'd accompanied Bobby Helpman on a tour and in, uh, they were doing the ballet, The Dream, and he was doing Oberon. And he said, during the American tour, we once played it in a floodlit stadium. And they gave Bobby Helpman, because of his seniority, the best room available. And in this sports stadium, the best room available was the umpire's room. It was the most commodious. And he said, I went round at the half to say, you know, half an hour, please, half an hour, please. He said, I got no reply. So I went in, and there, on a table in this dressing room, was a chair, and on that chair was Bobby Helpman with the eye makeup. He was doing a very elaborate eye makeup for Ober on a blue and gold. He said he was up on this chair on top of the table against the one naked light bulb hanging, doing this eye makeup, you see. And he said, Are you all right up there? And Bobby said, Yes, I'm fine, yes. But God knows how these umpires manage. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, isn't it? No. We'll take a break, though. We're back in a moment to talk some more to Kenneth Williams. <laughs> yeah, <that's great. laughs> Welcome back. My
my guest is Kenneth Wooden. Kenneth, I mentioned in the introduction that you have worked with some marvellous people in the theatre. We've talked about some of them. You worked with one of my favourite ladies, too, Dame Edith Evans. Uh, she was quite a, an imperious and, and witty lady, wasn't she? Oh, yes. And I was shocked because, you see, I was cast in this play with her. It was Gentle Jack by Robert Bolt. And uh, Binky, who was then in charge of Tenants, said to me, we've had quite a bit of trouble, you know, Kenneth, because when she was told about you, she said, what, not cast him? <laughs> cast Kenneth Williams in that role? And he said, well, why not, Dame Edith? And she said, well, he's got such a peculiar voice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's outrageous things to say about me. It is, yes. And I was, I was a bit apprehensive about working with her. In fact, the whole company was. It was a large company, over 40. And she said to me when the play was running, why don't they come into the dressing room and have a chat? And I said, well, they're all in awe of you. You are a figure of great awe to many actors. That you, she was, you know. People yeah. didn't feel at ease and able to say, have a cup of tea and a chat. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And we started this play and opened at the Theatre Royal Brighton. That was the opening of the tour. And she said to me, you're staying at the Royal Crescent. And I said, yes. So we'll have a taxi back. And so we took this taxi. And she said to me in the taxi, did they give you notes? Any notes after the show? And I said, yes. He came around, said several things that I was doing wrong. They gave me a couple of rewrites. And then think of for you. She said, yes. Binky came backstage and said, Hardy Amy's has designed very regal costumes, Dame Edith. You should look equally regal in them. Do you think that criticism is justified? And I said, no, I don't. I think any criticism of your deportment is tantamount to impertinence. And she said, mm, you're a very pleasant young man. <laughs> mm, you're a very pleasant young man, and there's no reason why the right girl shouldn't come along. <laughs> I said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I'm over 40. I was over 40 then. I mean, I'm considerably more now, as you can imagine. I said, I'm over 40. No, it won't happen. I live alone. I've got my own two rooms, kitchen, a bathroom, shove the arpic down the loo and run, you know. <laughs> Ties at all. And so she said, You can have supper. And so I said, All right, yes. And we got back to the Royal Crescent, and one table had a light over it. The rest of the banqueting hall was just dead. And this one chandelier lit a table, and they'd had these cold collations of tin, you know, those tin trays that cover a plate on which is the bit of ham and a rolling up bit of lettuce, yeah. a terrible old tired it's salad. Yeah. Yes, a cold collation. And we were the only ones dining because the show finished at what, 11? We'd had the notes. We weren't there till midnight. Everyone else had gone. And this ancient porter came in and said to Dame Edith, who was accompanied, because she was a Christian scientist, by her spiritual advisor, and he, sa he said to her, this woman wasn't there, you see, he said to Dame Edith, your, your, par your partner in crime's had her grub, and <laughs> she couldn't wait for you to finish the show, so she's gone off to bed, you see. But she said to me, you might fancy, you might fancy a drop of something with your grub. Do you, do you fancy a drop? She said, oh, yes, yes, <laughs> I, yes, I do. I think a half bottle of Beaujolais would not come amiss. So he said, oh, I thought you'd fancy that. I, 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 I've got a drop handy. <laughs> Bent down to this sideboard and then broke wind with a deafening report. <laughs> And she looked gravely affronted. She looked really quite affronted. And she said to me, this place has gone off terribly. <laughs> Oh, she had, she had great style. Oh, enormous. Great, great style. Nothing put her off, you no, know. No, no, indeed not. Nothing. I mean, even when the audience on that night at the Queen's, when we opened in London, there was mixed, what they call a mixed reception. The stalls, hurrah, bravo! But from the gods, there were quite a few other cracks, you see. <laughs> and it was quite nasty. And as the curtain hit the deck, she said, well, there was one bravo. And I said, no, Damie, they were saying, go home. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, <isn't that> <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's talk about, about another person you worked with. Uh, not an actor, but a, a marvellous comedian. You did lots of shows with, with, with Tony Hancock, didn't oh, you? Oh, yes, mm. yes. Hancock's Half Hour series. That's right, yes. yes. Was, was, was it uh, fun to do that series? Was there much mucking about? Well, and... he was very neurotic, you know. Really? A very neurotic man. You've had Harry on your show. You have had Harry Seacombe. Harry Seacombe, yes, indeed. And one of the most extraordinary things, and at least publicised, I don't think I've met anyone that's ever discussed it, really in public, and that is that when Tony, he used to have these periods of instability, you know, he vanished, just vanished, and the BBC would land it with 13 episodes of Hancock's Half Hour, and no Hancock. <laughs> and do you know what, do you know who took over? No. Harry. Harry Seacombe. Harry Seacombe took over that series, and it was billed in the Radio Times as Hancock's Half Hour with, and then the cast, including Harry, of course. But nobody questioned it from the moment the series began to the time it came off. No one questioned it. He went to that microphone and played it as a character, which was, sounded Hancockian when you listened yeah. to the radio, and got all the laughs that Hancock would have got, I can assure you, every single one of them, and did it for 13 episodes brilliantly. And it was lovely. Bill Kerr and me, sure. Hattie, Sid, all thoroughly enjoyed it, and all felt afterwards, you know, oh, what a relief, because with Hancock, he questioned everything in the script. He turned to Galton and Simpson. I can't say that line. I can't say that line. I'm sorry, I can't say that line. That is not what the public expect of me, no. And he really believed these notices about little man against authority, and every line had to suit that, had to be tailored to that characterization. And you know as well as I do that comedy can't always lie solely in one direction, no, can it? No, no, no. Often there will be an inconsistency in a script, <coughs> and he always questioned those. And he went through curious bouts of depression, and I went to the London Clinic. He went in there for about four weeks for the dieting, ostensibly for dieting, but they calmed him and gave him various, what do you call it, sedatives. Mm. And I went there, and on the bed, on the bed, on the counterpane, was a whole mass of books. There, there was Thus Spake Zarathustra, that's Nietzsche, isn't it? There was Leibniz, Spinoza, the Bertrand Russell outline of Western philosophy. An incredible mass of erudite volumes. And I said, what are you doing with all, what are you doing with all this? And he said, I want to find out what, what life, what life is all about. And he got terribly earnest. He said, have you ever thought, mate? Have you ever thought, mate? What, what? What if there's no one up there? Hey? Eh? Ever thought about that? What if there's no one up there? What if it's all a joke? And I said, well, better make it a good one. I <laughs> I mean, it's no good, it's no good getting that worked up, is it? Because you can't, in actual fact, find in a philosophical treatise the answer to a man's existence. All philosophy can do is point ways of thought, but it can't evolve for you a faith. Faith is something which, like a man who puts his hand out in a dark room, hopes it'll be grasped, you know. I mean, that is an act of faith which you make as an individual. And if you're living in a rather spiritless age, and ours does seem to be, it seems to be a rather materialistic one. Men used to go to a, a priest and uh, unburden themselves. Now they lie on psychiatrist's couches most of the time, I think. I mean, those that can afford it, of course. I mean, <laughs> That's the way he went. I mean, that's what... I mean. Yes, indeed he did. Mm. He, he got more... You see, that, that thing of what are we about, why are we here, has life really got any purpose, does, if you don't make an act of faith, end up with nihilism. Mm. What about the, the thing that finally destroyed him? Was it that? Was it the self-doubt or, or what? I'm so, sure it was the self-doubt, yes. The complete lack. I mean, he threw out the writers. He threw out Galton and Simpson. He threw out Hattie. He threw out Sid James. One of his best feeds ever. Yes, right. Absolutely. And eventually threw out everything. Yes. What about the, the, the thing of fame, though? Did he handle that well, the recognition Oh, that aspect? was incredible, you know, yes. Because he kept saying to me, I can't understand it. And I remember we were walking through Hyde Park and we came out Kensington Gore side and we were crossing and the bus that was stopping at the lights a bus, I mean, a double-decker bus. The driver got out, got out. It's Tone, Tone, it's Tone, isn't it, Tone? And Tone said, yes. And he grabbed him, he said, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to shake your hand. Oh, mate, you're one of the funniest blokes I've And went on and on, and people on the bus said, well, come on, where's this bus? Why isn't this bus going? And then they got out. People saying, look here, this bus... Oh, it's Hank! Oh, may I say? And they were all shaking hands with him, too. And then other people who were hooting behind were saying, who is it? And they were getting out. And eventually the whole road was full of people milling around Tony Hank. <laughs> and that is, I suppose, enormous fame, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. And how did he cope with that situation? Did he enjoy that? Yes, he did. Yes, he said to me, I like it. But on the other hand, I feel terrible guilt about the money. I said, do you? <laughs> he said, yes. He said, you know, I'm getting thousands. I thought, I wish some of it was coming my way. <laughs> I don't, know about, I don't know if you're aware of it with the BBC pay, but I was on three guineas for each Hancock's half hour. Three guineas? Yes, and I said, I don't think three guineas is a lot. And they said, what are you talking about? You get half again for the repeat? 
So you get something like you get something like two, three dollars a show. Right. That was what I got oh, when no. I started with him. That was what I got. Oh, and I was God. raised eventually when I went with work Kenneth Horn. I was raised the princely sum of six pounds. Good. No. <laughs> I don't know what that translates. I mean, that's amazing. Well, that says twelve dollars, isn't it? But I mean, that's astonishing because people always assume, don't they, if you're on radio, if you're uh, in the entertainment <laughs> business, that, that you own yes, fortunes. Yes, they do. Yeah. I said to Clement Freud, you know, Clement Freud was on it? the thing with me. I said it's rotten money, you know, isn't it? I mean, thirty pounds is what we're getting today. And he said yes. And I've heard that Parsons is on more. I said, is he? <laughs> And we found out. We went to him and said, you want more? Are you getting more? And he said, well, yes, I, I'm, um, I'm on five pounds more, but then I am the chairman. And I said, I don't think, I don't see why that gives you any right to a higher salary. After all, we're the ones that are saying things. All you're doing is counting up a few marks, uh, isn't it? Uh, but th that, that is how they handle it. But you see, let's, I mean, you told me something the other day when we were having dinner about the, which surprised me, frankly, about the um, Carry On series, for instance. I mean, what was your... You did 26 of those... Yes, yeah, so the first one was shot, what, 57, 1957, and I paid £800 for the entire film. And I used to say to Sid James, it's terrible money, you know. But Sid always said, don't worry, because you're getting one a year. Yes, that right. was the assumption, that yes. because it was a series, yes. you were doing all right. Going back to that point about Hancock and handling fame, I suppose it's the predicament of every funny man that people approach you in a certain way. Yes. They more or less come up to you and say, have you heard this one? Or, oh, yeah. Or equally bad partner, make me laugh. That's right, yes. Well, wh what do you do in that situation? Well, I mean, very often, you see, they'll do it. And especially if it's restaurants, they'll do it. They can't say, sign this menu. And they say, make God do something funny. So I always say, very well, I will do something funny for you, certainly, yes. I will give you my impersonation of Queen Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Then they go home. Then they go home. Yes. Well, what about the other thing too? About you have this very distinctive, uh, characteristic style of yours, and and many many voices, and you therefore become the subject of the impressionists. Yes. Um, what do you would you feel when you hear people taking off? Well, I mean, Stanley Baxter said to me, they're doing you on Who Do You Do? That was a series on yes. television. There's a fair boy who comes on Does You every week. I said, what? What does he do of me? I mean, I've got several voices. Which one's he doing? Because is it nine, something's Novell? Or is it my grandfather? Oh, oh, Judith Chalmers, if only I could get my hands around you. <laughs> or is it... The answer lurries in the soil because that was Arthur Fallon. You know, I used to do uh, the answer lurries in the soil. You eat many dares, soft September morn, cheeks as red as apples, and her hair is gold as corn. And I said, Which one? He said, Oh, they do that wah. I said, Wah? What do you mean, wah? And he said, Well, you have that sort of wah. So I said, Wah, wah. <laughs> I said, I don't think I do at all. But there you are. You, you never know how you are seen from the outside, do you? No. But you do use your voices in a, in a way to mask the real you. And I wonder what the real Kenneth Williams is, you see. Oh, I suppose first thing in the morning, it's spiritless, dreary. You know, there's the toothpaste to be squeezed. The... <laughs> yes, it takes time, doesn't it? The blood, the blood rushes to the head when you do the laces. And you think, oh, the morale is round the ankles. And then the phone rings, you know. And I say, hello. And then someone grabs oh, hello. And immediately assume another persona. I think you are, roughly speaking, rather as Emerson described it. He said, you have as many many personalities as you have friends. And I think that's true. And it depends on who you're with, the sort of um, tone are you, that you take. And when one's with you, you, are, you, you create an uninhibited atmosphere and people become friendly and warm. And so an interview develops charmingly, as opposed to those idiots who just give you question after question without any real bringing out, you know what I mean? So that's the difference, I think, that the somebody does bring out the best in you. I thank you. Uh, I thank you for the compliment, sir, and I thank you for the interview. Um, you are staying on, of course, but for the moment, Kenneth Williams. Thank you very much, indeed. Kenneth Williams. <laughs> we will be back in a moment for a song from and a talk to John English. See you after this break. It's a real theatrical event, isn't it? This sort of rock thing nowadays. Oh, it certainly is. It's, mm. uh, it's the first time I've worn a tie in yeah, It's doing in, in sort of honour of the programme. You're, it's you're not quite stage. wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> you came here, in fact, as I said, when you were 12, didn't you? Yeah. Australia. Yeah. What did you expect? 
to find when you came here? Uh, well, this is very interesting. Uh, we were sort of victims of the Australia House con, really. <laughs> well, I, I sort of got here and I moved to what I considered to be... It's not that funny. It's the, the, the sort of... Well, Broken Hill. I expect I'd be going to school by, by wireless and uh, riding a horse, you know, to the shopping centre and everything. And uh, when we got here, we, we, we sort of asked the cab driver to take us out to Cabramatta. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> Cabramatta is sort of like Brixton with no buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we sort of got out there and uh, the first sort of thing I remember about it was it was very, very hot and there weren't any kangaroos. And uh, I had to go to a proper school and I wasn't allowed to sort of talk on the radio. And, but the one thing I do remember is that we had quite a long sort of amount of grass in the backyard. And we were terrified to go out there for two weeks because of the little pamphlet they give you when you get off the boat that says there are more poisonous snakes in Australia per square inch than poisonous spiders. So we were just sort of trapped in the kitchen there. You know? yeah. <laughs> what were the first gigs that you started doing when you started into the music scene? They were, back in the sort of middle 60s, everyone booked bands. It was sort of pre-disco. Uh, everyone booked bands for sort of weddings and 21sts and bar mitzvahs and high school fates which usually turned out into high school fights and uh, I mean you'd, you'd wind up playing anywhere literally you, you, you sort of the, the blue fountain down in, in Fairfield was was a, a little room above a coffee shop and uh, what I sort of remember about that was that we had to play teddy bears picnic every time a fight broke out so the bouncers could come up from around the back. Why did it teddy bears picnic? I mean... Well they just said play teddy bears picnic so we'd, we'd be playing sort of a Wilson Pickett song and thundering away and go, da 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 and these two blokes would be pulling the PA down. <laughs> <laughs> and what, was there a moment when you were doing those early gigs that you decided that, you know, you wanted to go on stage and be a performer? Well, it, I think the moment in, in 1969, uh, I just, I just left school and I was going to university trying to stay out of the army. And we, uh, we were asked to do six months with, with Johnny O'Keefe, who was, uh, yeah. well, probably the sort of most famous rock singer Australia's ever produced, and certainly here. Um, that was when I realised that, in fact, people did take notice of whoever was performing on stage at the time, because, I mean, nobody ever took any notice of us before. It was just like having a radio on. Um, they, uh, they actually stood up and clapped him, and I, used to, I was sitting there behind my little Farfisa organ that I can't play. I sort of play like that. And uh, I, sh I used to shut my eyes and think, look, it's, it's really possible. Um, then, of course, like he sort of, he went west and I went back to university. Um, but but it, that sort of stayed with me then, I think. Yeah, you got the, the sort of first impulse back from the audience. Yeah, the, yeah. the first feeling that, that, that there is an audience there and, and, you know, with a little bit of luck, they can actually like you instead yeah. of throw things at you and tell them you're too loud, you know. Yeah. Which is... well, but you got your big break, of course, in, in Judas Christ... Uh, Judas Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. It was time which you played Judas. Uh, what was... The, I mean, you worked in a bank, weren't you, when you, when you went for the audition? Yeah, I had a sort of whole lot of jobs. We were sort of... Um, at school, I, I used to tell everyone I wanted to be a journalist, particularly the, the, the sort of vocational guidance teachers, because it sounded just a little bit sort of more right-wing than a rock and roll singer, and uh, <laughs> I was never really particularly game to tell them I wanted to be a rock and roll singer, because I thought, you know, they'd laugh or cane me or something. They used to cane me for everything else. <laughs> but... Um, I, I, so I, I still had this sort of impulse put in me all the way through high school about respectability. So I, I sort of used to get jobs in a bank and wear bobby pins so my hair would be short when I'd be sort of uh, serving the customers and on the weekends I'd sort of <laughs> rip out and become a hippie, you know. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, there was a lot of us around it, those these strange schizophrenic creatures, you know. Yeah, but of course there must have been immense competition for, for that, uh, that casting that you went for. Well, it was... It was really a question of, um, I read it in the paper, I went down. I was actually the first person auditioned because um, the ABC wanted to do some filming for the auditions and I thought, oh, everyone's going to queue up, but they were all pros. They had all these opera singers doing push-ups. That's the first thing I remember. Blokes <laughs> and me, 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 me. And I, I said, I don't mind being filmed. So I, I was the first person auditioned and I did it in Matai, I remember. And they said, can you jump around? So I did and split my trousers completely right <laughs> away. And uh, I had to sort of go back to the, the bank with a towel around me. But that was instant fame time, wasn't it? Because, I mean, that really made it very big for you. How do you cope with the instant fame, the recognition? We're talking there about Tony Hancock and things like that. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, <coughs> it was really thrown to the wolves time. Um, I literally went from overnight sort of 
bank clerk into this show, this sort of monstrous extravaganza, and it was, it was in fact the largest production of Superstar put on anywhere in the world. I think the set in 1971 cost about a million and a half dollars. Yeah. And we took it on tour, and the first place we played was, was the Adelaide, the tennis courts in Adelaide. And there were 12,000 people there for the first night, but they, they were an invited audience of 12,000 people, like Gough Whitlands and people, all sitting there, and then there was me. And I had to sort of go out and look at these sort of vague... I mean, they looked like 12,000 penguins <laughs> sitting out there sort of looking at me. And they didn't... After the first song, nobody clapped. They didn't say a word. Because it, they were used to the Grand Opry. So. Yes. And at the end of it, I just thought, well, you know, who wanted to be a singer anyway? <laughs> and uh, and I, I sort of went home to bed and the reviews came out the next day and they were really good. So for four hours in the morning, I was the most sort of obnoxious creature ever created. I was, Were you? Oh, I was a terrible, terrible big head. Really? I, I wouldn't talk to anybody, wife, nobody. And I was like, well, of course, it's me in the mirror. <laughs> Practising my acceptance speech from a knighthood and everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a likely to. Yes. Yeah. And then they, they called a rehearsal for one o'clock, so I sort of arrived. And Harry Miller was there, sort of talking to various people. And I walked past and said, hi, Harry. <laughs> he said, what was your name again? <laughs> That's a squelch, there's a put down that gun, yes. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have any examples of put downs in the pop world? Yes, yeah, there's a famous one. I read it actually and I cut it out immediately. It's not going to matter. It was in the Telegraph. It said that William Wyler had a dinner party and uh, he leant across to one of the Osman boys and said, I think you have Van Gogh's ear for music. <laughs> 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 Did he understand it, the Osman show? He said, gee, thanks. <laughs> John, let's, well, let's talk a bit about this life that you lead as a, as a sort of rock and roll star. Um, first of all, what about the adulation that you get now? You, you've talked there about how Harry Miller sort of put you down and you were then on ground floor level again. But what about nowadays when you've got, you've got all those screaming kids fainting and throwing themselves at you and that sort of thing? How do you cope, cope with that? I do. <laughs> well, oh, well, uh, audiences in Australia have grown up an enormous amount. Uh, the audiences in Australia are very, very laid back, mm. I think, and so it doesn't really occur. And we, we, you know, I'd forgotten about it all, actually, because it's all, there you go, John, now in uh, sort of gigs. And, and, yes. and it's, it's, I've got this nice sort of one-to-one -one rapport with people. So we went to Scandinavia and... Um, I forgot when it was, February, and it was all on again. It was all, all the screaming, sort of shouting. And, and you feel somehow sort of detached. You keep sort of thinking, isn't this great? And at the back of your mind, you keep thinking, why? Why are they doing this? I mean, why are they screaming? Because there's very little difference between a bunch of little girls going, I love you, I love you, and a bunch of national fronts going, I hate you, I hate you, in the, in the end. <laughs> It's, 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 it's equally frightening. It's mob hysteria. It's, it's exactly mob hysteria. I, you're just a catalyst. I mean, if you, if you go away thinking, oh, they're all doing it for me, you're kidding yourself because it's, it's really just, I mean, you're just there for the moment. And, the, the, and, and I think little girls, because I've got two myself now, are really, they go through a phase where they just really want something to scream at. And if there's nothing there, they'll invent it. Um, so I think you just have to accept it, but as long as you take it in, in perspective, everything's fine. Well, of course, a lot of people, or not a lot, but some people in the rock scene don't, do they? And it's just destroyed them. I mean, they've begun to believe the adulation, and then there's the, the drugs and all that sort of thing. Oh, sure. Well, it's a... I think it's a trap. I think it's, it's actually... <laughs> everything, I, everything I start to say sounds like a cliché. I was going to say it's very lonely at the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, say it, say it. OK. It's a very bit of conviction. <clears throat> it's very lonely. Top. <laughs> I think it is too, don't you, Kenneth? <laughs> no, I do understand that adulation thing, because I remember Jim Dale. Do you remember Jim Dale starting as a pop singer? Did, and he said to me, it was frightening, because that's why he graduated and said, I prefer acting. And he got right mm. away from the pop scene, because he said there, there, there were girls standing at the stage door saying, sign it on my breast, sign it, <laughs> please. <laughs> Go on. We said it with an indelible ink yes. on, on flesh. It was horrifying. That's it. <laughs> I had that happen to me in Australia. You had what? I had a girl who bared a boob at me in Australia <gasps> and said, sign it. <laughs> <laughs> and did you, Mrs? Might have been your daughter. You never know. It was amazing. I had a fella last week. A fella up the road, but... They're a bit like that at the club at the road. <laughs> <laughs> but what about this acting thing? Because you mentioned that Jim Dale did Cross the Cross, and, and, and you did it as, as well, of course, very successfully. Mm. Did you find it very difficult? 
making the transition? I, f I, I honestly don't believe there's a lot of difference. If you're singing a song, you're, you're performing, you're putting a certain amount of emotional input into a, a performance. And the same really goes for acting. But you see, I'm, I'm absolutely nothing like Kenneth. I'm, I'm really not a very good character actor. The only sort of parts I can play are parts that I can see me doing. Um, and in that essence, I really don't sort of make a lot of different. I don't differentiate a lot between singing and acting. I do find it most enjoyable um, to just sort of detach yourself and, and do different things. Is there anything about the technique of singing um, that, that you bring into acting itself? I think so. I think one of the interesting things when I was doing Against the Wind, um, Mary Larkin, who, who played Mary, uh, her boyfriend was out here and was also in the series. And he's a very fine actor called Jim Norton from England. He's done all sorts of things. Um, and I saw him marking his script one day and I saw him a little sort of inverted semicircle with a dot in it. And I said, that's, that's a pause sign in music. He said, yeah, that's right. I, I, I didn't know that. But apparently the rest signs, uh, or the, you know, that's when it really it struck me that there's actually the same notation used as music. So from that point on, when I had a sort of speech, I almost used to, to score it with rests and pauses and, really? and stuff. Really? Like a, a found musical it, score? Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. found it very similar. It. Have you ever used right. that technique at all, Kenna? No, but the notes in the margin are very useful. And there's, um, there's a marvellous story about notes in the margin of an aid memoir that went round government circles, and the minister wrote in the margin, because he didn't want to put anything rude, so he wrote round objects. <laughs> and by the time it got to Churchill, he said, who is round and what is the object to? <laughs> John, what about you now? You, you're going off to America. Um, how much impression are Australian uh, singers and musicians making on that scene out there? Well, I was talking to, um, uh, you know, your consummate American A&R men, who A&R means artist and repertoire yes, for right, a, a record company. And we used, to do a, we used to do a routine on stage about a fictional A&R man called Randy Hitler. <laughs> but, uh, and I met this guy, and he was the epitome of Randy Hitler, you see with the big cigar and I'm going to make his star. Um, and he told me, it, interestingly, that about 10 years ago, there was America, there was Britain, there were certain territories in Europe, and the rest of it was a courtesy to their local record companies that you'd accept records to listen to, put them on the bottom of the pile. Now, the Australian records actually go straight to the top of the pile and get listened to first. That's from an American saying. So I think it's very, very, it's extremely healthy in Australia now. Uh -huh. Probably the most healthy local music scene in the world. Well, you're off there soon, so I hope that you um, make it even more healthy for Australia and yourself out there. So and for the moment, John English, thank you very much indeed. John English. Thank you. Thank you, right, we're back in a moment for a song from Marsha Hines. See you after this break. My final guest tonight has had the kind of life which reads like fiction. Reared in the bush, he became his family's breadwinner at the age of eight when his father was injured. By the time he was 43, he could look back on a career as a fighter, a miner, and a kangaroo hunter. Then he decided to change his lifestyle and support his wife and five children by becoming an artist. Since then, he's sold his paintings of the Australian bush throughout the world, made two television series about the outback for ABC, and here's a glimpse of him in action, showing his infectious enthusiasm for the land he loves. Here. Look, you've got carvings, look at these, all around here. See here, look, look, everywhere on this. All this, look here. That's all carved stuff, see? Look, there's tracks here everywhere. See, everywhere you look, look, kangaroo tracks, emu tracks, see them go out there, even little rodents. Unbelievable. Look, everywhere, it's the whole wall. Oh, matey, look at this one. Look here. This is what I've been after. That's what I wanted to show you. Now, that's the track of the giant emu. That proves to me that this was done over 12,000 years ago because that bird was extinct 12,000 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Absalom. inspired you to take up painting of all things at the age of 43? Well, uh, probably an unusual story, Michael. The kangaroo shooting game had collapsed. The yeah. government came into power and changed the rules. And I was at loose ends trying to decide what I was going to do. And two, or, or actually a bank manager, that my bank, he said to me, would there be any chance of a friend and I hiring you to take us on a painting trip? They wanted to go out of the way where the tourists don't go 
and they knew nothing about, say, the bush as such, didn't want to break down and get lost, and they knew nothing about vehicles. So they said, what about you taking us? So I said, right, no worries at all. I can think out there, the world's like and think home. So <clears throat> I head off away with them and if they were painting in the morning, I'd put the camp oven on and cook you back to scones for morning tea and if it was after lunch and they're doing a scene, I'd then set up camp and put the dinner on and I would go and watch them paint, see, and I'm fascinated by this. And I'm looking and I said, like, how much do you get for one of these, see? And the bloke said, oh. He said this, he said, oh, I'll get about $400. I said, $400? <laughs> right, you know. Well, so after three days, I said, look, have you got a spare brush? You know, like... <laughs> 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 it's easy, isn't so, it, really? <clears throat> he said, yeah, here. And they gave me a brush, and I just get the scene. I thought, hell, I can paint that, so I start painting it. And afterwards, I finished it, and I said, well, what do you think of this? And they both come and look, and they nearly dropped dead. And I said, well, what's the matter? They said, there's nothing the matter. And I said, well... So, you know, I couldn't see anything in it in the first place. So anyway, I'd done this for three days. I'd brought home three paintings when I come home. And, and I'd, I'd never forget this, and my family never forget it. Uh, about half past four in the evening, we, I came home, and um, we had five children, and kids want to be fed. About half past five, we'd have our dinner. And by the time I'd gone and had a shower and got cleaned up, it's dinner time, so I sit down to dinner. Nobody knows that I've painted, see? And halfway through the meal, I said, look, I've got some news. I said, as from today, I am going to be a professional artist. <laughs> and my eldest daughter was 19 years of age at this time, and all the other ones were under this, and this dead silence at the table. And nearly finished dinner, so I go out to bring the paintings in. I'm the proudest bunch of these paintings. I want to show them the paintings. And when I go out, Colleen had said to her mother, the son must have got to dad, like, this is ridiculous. Nobody does this. <laughs> so I come in and showed these paintings, and they look, and I said, they're all right, you know, anyway. What happened that within, uh, within the first 12 months I was forced to build an art gallery because we used to show the, the paintings in the lounge room yeah. in the house and I had to get the people out the house otherwise there'd been a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Let, let's have a look then at some of, one of your paintings. In fact, one of the paintings that, that you've not managed to sell over, uh, overseas. You sell quite a bit overseas. And here we are, there's a painting there. Now that's... This, this particular painting, Michael, was the only painting I didn't sell in London. We had a, an exhibition in London with the Brushman of the Bush, opened by Her Majesty the Duchess of Kent, yeah. Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Kent. And what I try to do in a painting, I, I paint the landscape. Landscapes fascinate me. But I try to always look for the things that's happening in there. It may be an eagle landing on its nest, it may be man closing a gate. In this case, it's a dingo is coming in to, to drink. And the moment I see her, this is the, the female species, the bitch coming in there, and she's coming in and looking at that water, taking no notice of anything, I know immediately he's with her. And if he's with her, he will be looking. He's, he's guarding her, he's looking around. And if she came in looking around everywhere, odds on she's on her own. She's only by So yeah. this is what I try to do. I see. Let's go back to, to the very early days of your life, because you grew up in the, in the outback, and what kind of characters do you remember? Because that kind of, uh, of situation must breed a very definite oh. kind of character. What, what wow, did you remember from your childhood? Well, in, in that period, there was one chap that possibly has stood out in my mind and possibly influenced my life more than I've realised over the years, because often I've thought back and I thought it was him. And you can never forget this chap because he had a joint off every finger. Every Half finger. Of the, every, every finger, they'd be, say, that one there and this one here and this one down here and everything. And straight away you, you'd say, what in the hell happened? You're getting a buzz sore or something. And he, he had eight children. His family was eight children. And in the Depression, he would go broke, go bankrupt, nothing. And he would get a job then in the Cary country in Western Australia where the big trees are, in a timber cutter's camp. And he might, say, be... 200 pounds in debt, we'll just say, or more like it'd be 100 pounds or 50 pounds. But after he'd got in there for a week or so and everything was right, he'd put a finger up and knock a joint off. Good God. Chop a finger off. And this chap, I learned more off that man all my life because he said, lad, you never give up. You never give up, he needs to say. And then he, he, he'd do anything. He could fix anything. If, if, say, my bike broke down the pit, he said, bring it up here. And he'd show me how to pull up the piece and do it. He said, you do anything. And he took the, the, the finger off for compensation. He'd take, he? the, he'd take that finger off and say, you get a hundred pound compensation, Good which would get him out of his trouble. And then he'd go on again. An extraordinary man. <laughs> so that's one in that period. Like, you know, there's men all through, like in the bush, there's hundreds of them, but that particular chap, he's always remembered that. We'll talk some more uh, in a moment to you, Jack Upson. Uh, we'll be back after this break. Yes, so Jack Absalom, John English and Kenneth Williams. Jack, let's have a look at another of your paintings, actually. Well, it's got special significance for you. 
Now, what, what is the significance of this tree here? Well, this painting, uh, Michael, I painted on the last TV series when it was up in the Cooper, the Cooper's Creek now. I believe that this tree has more, means more in Australia, is more significant than any other tree because that is the tree where they carved a dig for Burke and Wills when they came back from their crossing Australia. And of course they came back there and they perished there. But I always promised myself the next time I was up there I would paint that tree because it marks one of the greatest tragedies, the greatest feats in history of crossing Australia from south to north, yes. but also one of the greatest tragedies that they all perished there. Yes. And um, Let, I did that on the series. Let's talk then about a bit about this survival in this land which you know and, and you can survive in. I mean, how dangerous is it for city people to travel in the outback? Well, uh, uh, the biggest blue I think that people make, they, uh, for a start off, take the city people, take you as an example here. You don't know, say, the inland of Australia, and, and suppose you stop here for the next 10 years and you basically have your holidays and you go up the coast, get a caravan and you take them up to the coast, this sort of thing. Then one day you decide that we'll go to Ayers Rock. The odds are that you're going to treat the Ayers Rock trip exactly as the same you've treated the one up the coast. You've got a little two gallon water jar, you've got no spanners, no tools, no anything, and you head off. Now, that is dangerous, because you are going, once you go into the bush, the size of Australia for a start off is going to stun you, because you're going to drive, say, from here to Alice Springs, you're going to drive for four days, all day, 500 mile a day to get there. And all of a sudden it occurs to you, you think, hell, I'd hate to break down out here. There's nobody, there's no cars, there's no anything. You've got to be your own mechanic, your own guide, your own petrol supply, your own tyre supply, you name it, you've got to be it. You've got to have it there. And I suppose you have to have the ability to, to improvise in, in situations. Well, for course sake, suppose the car stops. Suppose the car, I don't know whether you know anything about cars, but no. the car stops. <laughs> you have to fix the thing. Yeah. I mean, it's no good, you can sit here out on the main road out here, we can sit and there'll be 50 cars coming along, we stop one, these toes are the same with it. Yeah. Not there. Yeah. I mean, I'm making extreme cases. I mean, if you're on a main road, that's not... You might be somebody coming along in a couple of days. Yeah. But... <laughs> well, this is right, but... I could take you on the main roads, but you might see somebody every three weeks. Now, that's getting dangerous. If it's summertime, that's very dangerous, because if you haven't got enough water, like, two or three days and you've had it. What, what practical ways can people improvise, though? I mean, it's oh, situation. there's millions of things you can do. Um, I wrote a book, Michael, on this, and one of the little things I put on there that seemed to caught the imagination that, say, a fire starts in a car, and people said, wouldn't it slay? I didn't put in a fire extinguisher. And you could grab a can of beer, shake hell of it, open it, and put the fire out with it. Really? CO2 and gas is just the same as a fire extinguisher. <laughs> and then, of course, afterwards, after you've got the fire, you can drink the rest. <laughs> <laughs> now, you describe yourself, actually, as a, as a bush anthropologist. Well, I grew up with Aborigines in the early days, so I was always interested in their culture, what happened. And actually, I seen them when they used to make their stone tools. This is the first thing that started on. And through the years that I've roamed around the bush, I've always been interested in their, uh, the tools they used. And I don't know whether you know this, but in Australia, basically, the stone age is the same in Australia as all over the world. You could get a stone implement here, and you could find the a replica the same in America, Norway, Denmark, it's the same. It was this same stone culture. It went through the whole world. And with a few exceptions, there are peculiar things to here that's only here, only little. It might be one stone, a silicon, that's not found anywhere else in the world, and something over there that's not found here, but only in minor things. The basic, the whole uh, major part of it is found everywhere in the world. So I took an interest in this, and uh, I had a very good friend in Adelaide who was... Uh, uh, Professor Tyndale, Norman Tyndale, who was the foremost authority in the world on Australian Aborigines, because he was the, he was here, and he, his anthropologist, and it was his main study. And uh, I used to go down and visit him and drive him mad every time I'd come in. I'd say, "What is this?" Or something showing something, what they do. What they do. And he would then say to me, uh, after he explained all this to me, "What do you want to have a look at this time?" And it might be stone axes. So he would take me in and show me everything they knew about stone axes. So you take this of 25 years of this grounding from the top man in the world on it. Is that, was that your education? Because you can't have had any formal education as such. Well, it, we start, started off on correspondence in, in the year when, when I was five and a half. And correspondence 40 years ago 
like was very, very rough, like the three R's, reading and writing and arithmetic. And you used to get the, the, cor the school the lessons uh, once a month, and you knock them off in half an hour, and wait for the next month for the next <laughs> lot. <laughs> and that's when we'd hope the train would break down, then you wouldn't get them. But what, what's going back to this work of yours, uh, with uh, the, the study in, in, in the bush, what's the most exciting discovery that you've made, do you think, while you've been there? Well, in, uh, in 1967, I, I was looking for donkeys. This is a funny way to tell this, but we'd had big rains and I was in the kangaroo game and I had commitments to supply meat and it didn't matter what sort of meat it was, whether it was donkeys, camels, horse or whatever it was. And I don't know what I'm going to do, I've got these commitments and a chap said to me, look, he said, there's 800 donkeys in one place there in the Flinders Ranges. So I off like a shot to get up there to have a look at these and before I can get there it rains eight inches. So we hassled around for a couple of days, you know, getting through and I was determined that I was going to have a look. And anyway, they'd all gone back in the ranges. Uh, before the rain, they were all out of the range. I could have got them easy, but once they get back in the range, you couldn't. So I go in there looking for them. Not so much to get them then, but to have a look how much trouble I would have later on to put freezers in there or do it. And this is when I come upon this, um, which is named Absalom's Gorge, of something like 6,000 carvings. That is the second oldest art place in the whole world, art form in the whole world. The only place that's older than that is a, in a a uh, cave in, I think it's Dudon in France, that's older than that in the whole world. I revolutionised the thinking on it. Before this, Michael, before this, it was accepted that the Aborigines had only been in Australia four to six thousand years. I never ever believed this, because I've seen places that I reckon was very old, but I couldn't prove it. And even though I'd said to anthropologists many times, look, this is ridiculous, four to six thousand years, couldn't be. And they would say, look, you've got to, you've got to have scientific proof. And I said, one day I will nail you to the wall over this. I will sh find a place that will prove all this. Well, when I found that and I came out and made a statement that this was at least 12,000 years old, I knew at least it had to be 12,000 years. Well, when they started carving down, it's up 20, 30,000 years. What was your feeling when you came across this oh, gorge? Oh, unbelievable. What? Unbelievable. Can you put it into words? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, could you imagine going into some place? Now, remember, you're in a very remote part of Australia. There's nothing else there. There's no noise, there's no motor cars, no plate. They're just utter, it's just quiet, complete quiet silence. And you walk into something where people 30,000 years ago have carved their whole life stories on the walls. All the history of their tribes, all there before you, the history of where this big flat, where the kangaroo feeds, and then you go across to here where the emu feeds. All this history laid out before you. 30,000 years ago. Can you comprehend 30,000 years? I can think back 30 years, mm. 50 years. How do you get in your mind 30,000 years? What sort of people were they? Were they tall? Were they like monkeys? Long arms? All these things race through your mind because you're stepping into something that's like so far back in history. It's like uncovering something that's never been seen before. It's just unbelievable. You love the country, don't oh, you? Oh, marvellous. I, I think we are love, well, I think we are very lucky and we are a privileged people to live in this country. Sorry. I would like to ask a question. Please do, Kenneth. I've seen these paintings and they are singularly beautiful. You've made it all sound very easy about taking up a brush. Now, I can understand someone, say, doing an illustration primitively, but how have you achieved, the painting, the first one we saw, that perspective, because surely perspective is one of the most difficult things in the world, and yet in that first painting, we saw that marvellous sense of depth and yeah. perspective. I mean, is that really the result of just picking up a brush? Well, actually, um, Kenneth, there's nothing in painting. All you've got to do is mix the right colour and put it in the right place. <laughs> 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 it's easy. It's like writing music. Yeah. That's right. That is so yeah. simple, it's not funny, isn't it? Now, you, you've got to admit that is simple, isn't it? Uh, you're you making it sound even right. if it was true, they'd uh, all be earning a point. I think, look, can, may I tell a little story? A few years ago, or I'd only been painting, say, six months, and, and I was with the chap that was an art teacher for 45 years. I'd invited him to go on a painting trip in the bush with me because he'd retired. And you must take somebody that has the same interests as you do. Like, if I took you, after you watching me paint for, say, six hours, and you've picked up every rock around the place, you're bored stiff, and you say, oh, for God's sake, how long is this going to go on for? You know, you want to get out. So he, you've got to paint the same as I do, otherwise it doesn't work. And we took these two paintings this night back to this homestead where we were stopping. We were guests at a station owner. And he looked at me and he said, oh, that's marvellous. He said, God, I'd love to be able to do that. To think just to sit on the weekend, 
and just do a painting like that. Marvellous, see? And I said, why don't you have a go? Anybody can paint, <laughs> see? And this chap never said a word, but that night he said to me, he said, you know what you told Murray today about anybody paint? He said, you don't know, don't know how wrong you are. And I said, oh, ridiculous, like anybody can paint. Like, look, I've just taken it up and there's nothing in it, see? And he said, look, how many people have you known that wish to play the piano, wish to learn to play the piano? He said, they buy a piano, they take piano lessons. He said, and they will learn to play a, a, a song, no worries at all, but they will never play music unless they've got that ear. They will never play music. Now, he said, you are lucky that you can look at the scene and you can interpret the scene, your eye can see it, and you can put it down, that your hand does what your eye is seeing. He said, believe me, it just doesn't work like you're saying it does. <laughs> but I've never, you're talking perspective, I have never, ever even thought about perspective. I look at the scene, I never sketch, I just look at the scene, put my board up and say, right, there's centre, I want that there, and away I go and I start painting it. Well, Ken, let, me, paint the thing let me ask you a question now. I mean, I mean, do, you've, heard, you've heard Jack talk about this, this obviously idyllic life for him in the, in the outback. I mean, could you settle into the outback? Not on your nelly. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I mean... You'd be, a, you'd be a rare and exotic flower in the outback, wouldn't you? You're not kidding. He's already told us what hazards and the adversity you'd face. Right. No, I'd need all that wonderful silence that he's spoken of, which sounds certainly, that does sound idyllic indeed, away from the madding crowd and all that rubbish. I'd love that, but I'd want all the 20th century luxury facilities. You would. The push-button loo and everything. <laughs> John, what about you? I, actually, this is going to sound terrible. I'm, I'm actually really happy where I am now. Yeah. Right exactly, just outside of Windsor, I've got a farm, and uh, exactly, you know, I can look out and see the river, and I've got a big glass wall and the stereo and the video cassette player, so that's <laughs> yeah, I can cop out. All the comforts of modern, yeah. modern outback living, yes. Now, Jack, finally, event, uh, and really finally, because we, we have run out of time, sadly, what do you think about us who live in cities and dwell in cities, briefly? Michael? I can never ever handle the traffic here. I think they're all nuts. They're all nuts. <laughs> no, look, I mean, I stop out often, stop at Balgala. If you want to come into town in that, say, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock period in the morning, an hour and a half to come like nine mile. That kills me. <laughs> like up where I come from, in an hour and a half, you can go 100 mile. <laughs> this is the thing that, the pace, I hate the pace. This go, go, go all the time. And you've got to because you get run over right. with a bus. <laughs> Michael, just one thing occurred to me. Right. Wouldn't it be a marvellous program? If you and I was to take Kenneth into the bush <laughs> and do a half hour program with him. What do you do? What a program! <laughs> That's a, that's a marvellous idea, but God knows what kind of problem we come back with. <laughs> anyway, Jack Absalom for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Jack Absalom. <laughs>